Uh, hello and welcome everyone to the second session of today's uh, Tax and Development Days. Uh, my name is Pierce O'Reilly and I'll be presenting today on the work that the, we have done on the economic impact assessment of the two-pillar solution. So just to give you an overview of, of what we'll be doing today, um, we'll first start by uh, focusing on uh, Pillar 1, looking at uh, the impact of Amount A of Pillar 1 on the global distribution of taxing rights and what it means for corporate income tax revenue. Um, next, we'll move to Pillar 2 and focus on its impacts on global profit shifting, on low tax profit globally, and also on corporate income tax revenues. And both of those aspects of the presentation will focus on what we at the OECD have done in cooperation with uh, inclusive framework member jurisdictions. But uh, towards the end of the presentation, I'll briefly discuss the work we're increasingly doing with countries, including developing countries, to try to help them carry out their own impact assessment uh, using their own taxpayer information um, to try and better support uh, their implementation or, and their decisions relating to the, the two-pillar solution. So just giving an overview of what our results are on the impact of Amount A of Pillar 1. So as, as many may know, Amount A is a reallocation of taxing rights um, towards market jurisdictions. And really what it does is it, uh, in practice, it reallocates taxing rights from investment hubs to market jurisdictions, to jurisdictions where sales are. And that's due to the, the nature of the rules. And we'll, we'll go into that in a bit more detail um, in a moment. But the, what it does is it provides this new taxing right uh, based on the excess profits of large profitable multinationals. What we find in our analysis that about 70% of all surrendered taxing rights uh, in the pillar come from investment hubs. So when we mean investment hub, when we say investment hubs, we mean jurisdictions that have high ratios of investment compared to the GDP. Um, so they have a lot of investment compared to the size of their economy. Investment hubs are uh, often low tax jurisdictions, and often they have very, very large amounts of, of profit of the in-scope m &Es. So it's really these jurisdictions who are, broadly speaking, losing taxing rights and market jurisdictions, including developing countries who are gaining taxing rights. Overall, we find that there's about 200 billion US dollars inside the amount A system. So that's the amount of, of, of global uh, profit that's going to be governed by amount A. Um, and broadly speaking, Amount A is, is not, in the first instance, about raising tax revenue. Really, it's about moving tax revenue, moving taxing rights around the world. But in fact, uh, it does still raise revenue in our analysis. And that's because we find that, broadly speaking, revenue is, or taxing rights are moved from low tax jurisdictions to high tax jurisdictions. So where you know a, a given dollar was taxed at a low rate in a low tax jurisdiction today, after Amante would be implemented, it would be uh, often taxed at a higher tax rate in a higher tax jurisdiction uh, tomorrow. And so broadly speaking, that's what we find raises revenue under Amante. We find that uh, the revenue gains really are, are spread all across the world. Um, smaller jurisdictions, lower income jurisdictions, higher income jurisdictions, um, uh, you know, all different jurisdiction types uh, gain revenues. We typically find that investment hubs, uh, which are usually low tax jurisdictions, they tend to lose revenues. Um, but we also find that lower and middle income countries tend to gain a little bit more from Amount A compared to higher income jurisdictions as a share of their, their current corporate tax base. So the percentage increase we find for lower and middle income jurisdictions is, is higher. And that's due to kind of specific features that um, are in the Amante rules, often that uh, developing countries have really argued for, that um, provide some specific benefits to them. And I'll talk about that in a, in a minute. Turning to the next slide then, looking at Pillar 2. So broadly speaking, what, what Pillar 2 does is that it levies this global minimum tax on the profits of large uh, international MEs. And we find that it's actually going to have potentially quite complex impacts on MEs activity and ME behavior. And that's really going to impact how, uh, you know, who benefits from the rules and, and how. 
what we find it will do is, is that it will reduce the gaps in tax rates between high tax and low tax jurisdictions. So in the world as it stands, without Pillar 2 being implemented, you know, there are many high tax jurisdictions worldwide. And then there are some low tax jurisdictions that using those low tax rates, they've been able to attract a lot of profit and a lot of investment. And because those jurisdictions will be very strongly imp impacted by Pillar 2, those tax rates in the low tax jurisdictions are going to go up. So there's going to be a smaller gap between the high tax jurisdictions and the low tax jurisdictions. And we think that that will call, mean that, that profit shifting, shifting activity to low tax jurisdictions to benefit from low tax rates is going to be less attractive for multinationals. And so we find that then that that will reduce profit shifting by those multinationals. We don't say that profit shifting will disappear altogether, but we do find it's going to be reduced. And we find globally we're, we expect uh, profit shifting to fall by about 50%. Off the back of that, we expect that the global minimum tax will reduce the amount of low tax profit worldwide. There will just be less low tax profit after the global minimum tax. And then that in turn is going to raise tax revenue. And we find that, uh, that we expect that the global minimum tax will raise CIT revenues by between six and a half and eight percent of global CIT. But there'll be strong variations um, uh, depending on the jurisdiction. So some jurisdictions may benefit more and some jurisdictions may benefit less. Turning to the next slide then. So we'll start and focus a little bit in more detail on pillar one. So if we'll go to the next slide again. Um, so what pillar one is, is that it's uh, amount A is uh, in, in a certain sense, it's, it's a reallocation of a stock of profit. And what is that profit? Well, it's uh, the profit of the largest multinationals in the world, but also the largest and most profitable multinationals in the world. And of those profitable multinationals, it's a share of their excess profits. So it's their profits above a certain threshold. So we have this uh, stock of profit and some countries are going to surrender that profit and other countries are going to receive that profit. And broadly speaking, it's the market jurisdictions where the sales are, where the users are, who are going to receive those profits. And it's jurisdictions that have the excess profits that are very, very profitable that are going to, to give up those profits. So that's where the profits are now. Those jurisdictions are going to surrender those profits. So how much profit is in scope? Well, it changes year on year. And so what you can see in the chart here is, is the global amount of profits uh, that we expect to be inside the amount A system. Um, for each year from 2016 to 2021. So this is who are the in-scope M&Es? We expect that there'll be in or around 100 M&Es, though it changes year on year. And we find that the amount of profit is broadly rising over time. And that's because the, you know, the largest and biggest M&Es in the world, their profits appear to be rising. You know, these M&Es are often very intangible intensive. Um, they're often market leaders. And so they have these super profits uh, that are often uh, shifted to low tech jurisdictions. Um, so there you can see a kind of a, a sectoral breakdown of, of the in-scope profits. There's a lot of digital firms in scope. There's a lot of pharmaceutical firms in scope, consumer goods firms in scope, often the kind of, you know, major intangible brands. They're the kinds of, of, of firms that are in scope. Um, you know, Amount A was, was designed in part to deal with the, the tax challenge of the digital economy and to give countries more taxing rights over, over digital businesses. And we find that it does that. So there's quite a lot of profit of, you know, look, digital giants in scope of, uh, of Amount A. So turning to the next slide, then we understand that we have this very large uh, pot of profit. And so the question is then under the amount A system, you know, which, which is complicated, where does it come from and where does it go? And the, the rules uh, governing the allocation of profits and then also the rules governing the kind of the, the surrendering of profits are very long, they're very complicated. But broadly speaking, the, and the end result is that profits are largely shifted from investment hubs towards market jurisdictions. So that's what you can see in the diagram here. On the left-hand side, we show, well, where are the profits going to come from? And then on the right-hand side, we show, well, where are the profits going to go? And we break down all of the jurisdictions uh, in our model, all the jurisdictions in the inclusive framework and beyond who might implement Amante. We break them down into, into three broad groups. First is the investment hubs. So that's you know jurisdictions that have very, very high amounts of investment compared to the size of their economy. Next is, is market jurisdiction. So any jurisdiction where NME has its sales. And our third category then is, is the parent jurisdiction. And what we find then is that investment hubs surrender most taxing rights, and most of those taxing rights go to market jurisdictions. Some jurisdiction, some you know, investment hubs and UPE jurisdictions do receive 
um, taxing rights under Amendment A. And that's, in a sense, kind of natural, because oftentimes a multinational's parent jurisdiction is a very large market in its own right. And so we, even though it's it's the UPE jurisdiction, because it has some of the sales of the m &E, it may be allocated taxing rights also under Amendment A. Of course, investment hubs are themselves markets. So they will receive, to the extent that they're markets, they will receive taxing rights as well. Um, but they tend to be pretty small. So the amount that they get under Amendment A also tend, tends to be pretty small. We find investment hubs to render most of the taxing rights under Amendment A, but in a certain to cert to a certain extent, um, in certain cases, UPE jurisdictions and market jurisdictions um, may surrender some taxing rights as well. But broadly speaking, the thrust of the reallocation under Amendment A is from investment hubs to to market jurisdictions. So turning to the next slide, then, what does that mean for tax revenues? Well, we find basically that Amendment A raises uh, tax revenues for most jurisdictions except investment hubs who, as I've shown in the previous slide, are surrendering taxing rights. So that's what you see in, in this chart here. We model for, for each year, 2017, 2018, 2019, depending on the data and the, and the profitability of the in-scope companies. We show amount A revenue gains as a share of CIT for high-income jurisdictions, middle-income jurisdictions, low-income jurisdictions, and investment hubs. And you can see that high-income, middle-income, and low-income jurisdictions all tend to gain taxing rights we find that investment hubs tend to lose taxing rights. And that then flows into the revenue figures that you can see. For each jurisdiction group on, on the left who are gaining, we see that the gains kind of gradually rise over time. We also typically find that low income and middle income jurisdictions tend to gain a little bit more as a share of their current allocation under the system than high income jurisdictions. And I'll talk more about why, why that is in a minute. And then for investment hubs, who are you know, net contributors to the system, we tend to find that they lose taxing rights and then they also tend to lose tax revenue. So with the next slide, just focusing in more, taking the investment hubs out of the picture, this is the same chart, which just with the investment hubs removed, we can see again that uh, you know, high income jurisdictions gain revenue, um, middle income jurisdictions also gain, and we find that low income jurisdictions gain uh, to a particularly large extent as a share of CIT. It's important to say that this is, these are not dollar values. Um, low income jurisdictions tend to be small economically compared to you know, the, the larger G20 countries. So their dollar allocation of amount A is likely to be pretty small, but then their, their allocation under the current system, their existing corporate tax bases also tend to be quite small. So in percentage terms, then they tend to gain slightly disproportionately compared to higher income countries. So turning to the next slide then, but this kind of begs the question then, well, why is it that um, lower and middle income jurisdictions are gaining slightly more as a percentage of, of the Amante system? And it's really due to kind of a series of quite technical, quite complex design features um, that are, are in the Amante system that kind of tilt the balance of allocations towards uh, smaller and low income countries, and then also protect them from having to surrender any taxing rights. So uh, in, in certain aspects of the, the, the rules, there are de minimis provisions that mean that, you know, even if you have some uh, profits that you might be called upon to surrender under amount A, under normal circumstances, if it's only a small amount of profit below a given dollar value, then you can hold on to that, that, those taxing rights. By the same token, there are rules also that say that, okay, if you would only get a small dollar value under amount A, we would say that's that's administratively too small to, to administer, then you might not get it under the system, except if you're a lower or lower middle income country. And so specific provisions that are built into the system there, and you know, many of these um, developing countries have really argued very hard for over the past years, um, they do have a positive impact on uh, developing countries' allocation under the Amante system. And so what we've done in this chart here is to try to model five of those provisions um, that uh, the developing countries have pushed for and secured that are in the, the Amante uh, agreement and try to compare what Amante would look like for low and middle income countries without those provisions. And we basically find that th those, that collection of, of, of different details essentially double uh, low and middle income countries revenue gains from amount A. So these are kind of important features that are, you know, are not, are, are quite technical. I, I don't go into them in, in too much detail, but they're, they're, uh, they're there and they're, they're important kind of 
concessions that uh, developing countries have won uh, as part of the negotiations. Um, so that uh, concludes what I have to say uh, on, on amount A. I, I hope we'll have time to, to return to it uh, in the Q&A. But turning next to uh, Pillar 2, and I'm going to present uh, two pieces of work that we've done looking at Pillar 2. The first is uh, an analysis of the location of low tax profit globally. So the global minimum tax is all about taxing up uh, low tax profit to a minimum rate. And one of the things as we've been talking to countries over recent years that we've increasingly realized is that while uh, you know the typical idea of low tax profit is that well there's low tax profit in low tax jurisdictions you know um zero tax jurisdictions are very like low tax jurisdictions as we talk to countries about pillar two implementation we kind of increasingly realized that there's low tax profit in more places than just low tax jurisdictions and so what do I mean by that? And, and this slide here shows tax incentives in uh, a set of developing countries uh, for, that we have included in a tax incentives database. And these are different kinds of tax incentives that countries are offering to multinationals to incentivize investment. And if you look at the far left bar, we can see that in low income, lower middle income countries and upper middle income countries, between 75 and 90% of these countries have some form of tax incentive that exempts multinational businesses in those countries from corporate income tax. So in all of those countries, there's at least some multinationals that are paying zero tax rates. And we think that that's important because we hear a lot from developing countries that they're under a lot of pressure to offer tax incentives, even though those tax incentives are often bad value for money. Um, but also that those tax incentives mean that there's potentially quite a lot of low tax profit in developing countries. And that then means that the application of the global minimum tax is going to impact the use of those tax incentives for developing countries. And it also means that there is profit in developing countries now that developing countries can tax themselves under the minimum tax. And a lot of the work that we've done over the past couple of years has been to try to quantify that amount of low tax profit. How much low tax profit is there in developing countries? We know that the tax incentives are there, so we know that there's some, but we spend a lot of time trying to figure out exactly how much. So if we can just go to the next slide. So what we've tried to do is to try to look beyond an average effective tax rate in a given jurisdiction. And a thing that's true about a lot of developing countries is that they have quite high tax rates on businesses but they combine these high tax rates with some tax incentives that mean that even though the average tax rate may be high, some businesses may be paying a very low tax rate. So we have gone out and we've gathered new data from uh, OECD member jurisdictions and, and IF member jurisdictions as well on the tax rates being paid by their multinationals worldwide. So for example, from US m &Es, there's data available on you know, how much in you know, France, for example, um, how many of their MNEs are paying high tax rates and how many of their MNEs are paying low tax rates. And so we've tried to use this new data to build up a picture on the distribution of tax rates that MNEs are paying within any given jurisdiction. So to try to take seriously this idea that in any given jurisdiction, there's going to be some MNEs paying a high tax rate, maybe close to the statutory rate, but some MNEs benefiting from a tax incentive that may be paying very low tax rates. So if we go to the next slide, um, we'll try and show some results from this work. And really what it shows, so this is a chart that compares the average tax rate in a given jurisdiction with the amount of tax that's uh, subject to an effect, an, a low effective rate of taxation in that jurisdiction. And so if you look on the, the, the x-axis, you can see that for jurisdictions that have a very low uh, average effective tax rate. So that's the jurisdictions on the left-hand side of the chart. They have a lot of low tax profit. In fact, you can see in the set of, of dotted lines up at the top left there, that in some jurisdictions, for example, with a 0% um, average effective tax rate, all of the profit in that jurisdiction is subject to an effective rate that's below 15%. That's what we mean by low tax profit. But then what we're really interested in is these dots inside the blue box. So each one of these dots is a country. 
Each country in that blue box has an average effective tax rate that's above the minimum rate of 15%. But each one of those dots also has some low tax profit. So these are countries where you think that, okay, well, if you look at the statutory tax rate, they might not benefit from the minimum tax because they don't have any low tax profit. But then when you take a closer look, there is some low tax profit in that country. And this is really important when you start to think about who is going to benefit from the minimum tax. And it's really important for developing countries to think about when they think about what the minimum tax might mean for them, both in terms of tax revenues that are available to them, but also in terms of um, how effective are their tax incentives going to be uh, after the implementation of the minimum tax. So if we just go to the next slide. Um, so this kind of shows sim similar data again. And just in the, in the left-hand column there is the, is the share of all of the profit and each group of jurisdictions that is taxed at an effective rate below 15%. So we find about 28% of high income of profit in high income jurisdictions is taxed at an effective rate below 15%. In upper middle income countries, we find that it's 24. In lower middle income countries, we find that it's 18. In lower income countries, we find that it's 28. And in investment hubs, we find that it's 79. So most profit in investment hubs is sort of low tax rates, which we probably kind of knew already, but there's also quite a lot of low tax profit outside investment hubs. And that's going to matter a lot when we try and think about the impact of Pillar 2, um, which I'll turn to, I think, in the next slide. So off the back of that data analysis on the location of low tax profit globally, then we start to try to analyze the effect of the global minimum tax. Uh, next slide. So there's a lot more detail in the paper, and I won't go through it in, in too much detail here, but we try to get a good picture of the tax base of the global minimum tax. So the tax base is a, you know, it's it's one tax base worldwide. So it's been very important to us to make sure that we try to get as close as we possibly can to what that tax base actually is to try and get uh, the right revenue number. And that's important because also there are a variety of like uh, deductions and exclusions from the tax base to try and protect certain tax incentives, certain kinds of tax incentives, to try to protect MEs that are doing real activity in jurisdictions. And it's very important to take those into account. And then we try and model this, this reaction that I mentioned earlier, which is that we expect that once, um, that we expect the profit shifting will fall after the implementation of the minimum tax. And that's because we think that if you might have been profit shifting, you know, a few years ago to a jurisdiction, a low tax jurisdiction somewhere and paying a 0% rate, now that, that, that profit shifting will only get you to a 15% rate. And so we think that that may mean that some M&Es are going to reduce the amount of profit they shift. We don't think it's going to necessarily make profit shifting disappear, but we do think it'll reduce the intensity of the profit shifting. And we think that that's going to be a very important reaction. And then the last thing that we do to try and understand this is we try and model the implementation of, of the global minimum tax. So, so far we have about uh, 35 jurisdictions have already uh, implemented or are planning on implementing this year, the minimum tax, even more jurisdictions we expect to implement next year. But still the full scale of global implementation is, is uncertain. So we try and model that to try and see like, okay, well, let's assume that only 70% of jurisdictions implement, let's assume that 85%, let's assume that everybody implements. So we have different scenarios to try and see what that does. And really what it means is that, what it shows, and I'll, I'll show this in a moment, is that the more, the more countries don't implement, the better it is for those that, that do. But jurisdictions that themselves don't implement stand to, to, to potentially lose because if there's low tax profit in my jurisdiction and I don't tax it, somebody else can tax it under the global minimum tax. And this is the really important feature that if you don't tax it yourself, you risk that someone else will come along and levy tax on, and levy tax on profit that otherwise would have been yours to tax. So if we just go on to the next slide, so as I've said, we find that there will be a global reduction in profit shifting based on our model. We expect total profit shifting to fall by about half 
So it won't end, but it will fall. Um, that profit shifting means that there'll be more profit left back at the source jurisdiction. And that's again what you see on the left hand side of the chart. So it's a lot like pillar, it's a lot like pillar one. We expect that will result in more tax base for high income jurisdictions, middle income jurisdictions, low income jurisdictions who are less exposed to profit shifting. But it means that investment hubs won't be receiving those shifted profits anymore, or at least won't won't receive them to the same extent as they used to. So that's a really important first impact. Next, in the next slide, what we also see is that we expect that global low tax profits will fall. So here in the gray bars, we find the total amount of, of profit that's, that's subject to a tax rate below 15%. So you can see again, as I said before, it's about 28% in high income jurisdictions. It's a little bit lower in, in middle income jurisdictions. It's a little bit higher in low income jurisdictions. Just each gray bar from left to right. In investment hubs, there's really a lot of low tax profit. And then globally, we find that about 30 to 35% of, of uh, global profits are subject to a tax rate that's uh, below 15%. So in the gray bars, that's the, the state of the world kind of today, before the implementation of the tax. And then in the blue bars, we find is, is how much low tax profit is going to be left after the global minimum tax is, inter is introduced. So year one in Navy, and then after uh, 10 years of implementation in blue. And you can see that the amount of profit globally that's low tax falls a lot. And that's a really important, you know, that's a really important impact of the minimum taxes that is just mean that, that less corporate profits globally are going to be subject to these very low tax rates. You might ask, well, why, why is it possible that some profit is still going to be subject to low tax? Why is it that if there's a minimum tax on profits globally, that some profit is going to be uh, still subject to a, a, a tax rate below the minimum tax rate of 15%. And the reason is a feature of the minimum tax, the substance-based income exclusion. And what this does is that it provides that if a multinational has enough payroll and assets in a given jurisdiction, it means that some of its income can be subject to an effective tax rate below 15%. And this is a special feature in the rules that allows countries that are offering low tax rates to MEs in order to get real activity into their jurisdiction, so physical assets and payroll, they can continue to offer tax incentives that will allow the MEs to have some low tax profit to maintain that attractiveness. So that, that feature means that there will still be some low tax profit in the system because some MEs that have enough footprint in the given jurisdiction may still be subject to low effective tax rates. And that was a thing that a lot of developing countries wanted because they wanted the ability to continue to use tax to attract investment. Now, having said that, we also knew, and developing countries knew as well, I think that you know, a lot of those tax incentives were too generous to MEs. And so what the minimum tax then does is that it says, okay, well, if you aren't implementing a big investment in a country, but you still have a lot of profit that's low taxed, then you will pay top up tax. Turning then to the next slide. So because global low tax profits will be reduced, we expect the global tax rates, global tax revenues will increase. We expect that all jurisdictions across the world, high income jurisdictions, low income jurisdictions, investment hub, we expect that everybody's going to gain um, tax revenue from the implementation of the global minimum tax. Um, that's because there's, we expect that there's low tax profit almost everywhere. Um, and we expect that everybody is going to be able to tax up some of that low tax profit. Even investment hubs that we think will lose tax base because profit shifting is going to fall, we still expect them to gain tax revenue because the, whatever profit remains in the investment hub, they expect will be taxed at a higher tax rate, so they will gain revenue. So even though the reform is bad for investment hubs in, in a certain sense, because they're less attractive destinations for investment and profit, it's also good news for them in another sense, because we expect that they'll gain tax revenue. But for high income and, and middle income and, and low income countries, we expect that the, the tax revenues are going to be in and around, it, it depends a lot on the country, but somewhere between 4 and 10% of, um, uh, of, of existing CIT revenues. And a lot depends then 
on the implementation decisions of a given country. So if you yourself don't implement the minimum tax, you place your own potential revenue gains at risk, but also you open the possibility that another jurisdiction may tax low tax profit that's in your jurisdiction. So that's why we think countries need to think hard about how to implement, what to implement, whether to implement. The rules come in different forms, um, which I'll speak to in a second, and different countries may want to introduce different aspects of the rules. And there, there isn't necessarily a, really a one-size-all solution. Countries have to think through their own capacity, have to think through their own priorities, have to look at their own MEs, at the businesses doing business in their jurisdiction, um, to try and see what they should do. So just going to the next slide, this breaks down revenue gains for developing countries. Um, and it breaks them down into different um, categories, different sources of revenue. So where the revenue from the minimum tax might come from. So it might come from reduced profit shifting, that's in gray. It might come from countries topping up tax that's in their own country, topping up low tax profit that's in their own country. So that's what's in Navy. That's what's, you know, there's low tax profit in my country, either because I have a low statutory tax rate or because I have a tax incentive. And there's a business in my country subject to a low tax rate, and I want to tax it up myself. That's what's in blue. And then the remaining um, bars, the, the, the light blue and the light gray, they're basically somebody else somewhere has some low tax profit and I'm going to exercise a taxing right over that low tax profit in another jurisdiction. Where the, the, the revenue gains come from is going to depend, to depend a lot on implementation decisions. So it's going, so, so any given country's revenue gains are gonna depend on what other countries do. If every country tops up their own low tax profit, then every country, that's the amount that they'll get. Every country will get their own low tax profit. Any low tax profit in their jurisdiction, they will get. But if other countries don't top up, then I can decide to levy top up tax on their low tax profit. And so that's what's important. Number one is that if you don't top up tax, low, low tax profit in your own jurisdiction, there's a risk that somebody else might. But also, if other countries don't levy top of taxes themselves, there's opportunities for, for countries to, to tax foreign profits that are currently low taxed. So this just kind of summarizes our overall assessment of what the minimum tax is going to do. First, we think it, it's gonna reduce these gaps that are currently in the system between high tax jurisdictions and low tax jurisdictions. We think that's gonna lead to a more efficient system overall because we think that m and profit and investment decisions aren't going to be so distorted by, by this seeking out of low tax opportunities. We think that that's going to have these, these knock-on impacts on, on profit shifting. We think then that that's going to have knock-on impacts on, on the amount of global low tax profit that's in the world. And then in turn, we expect that to, to raise tax revenue. So we have carried out our own assessment at the OECD, which I've, I've just presented. Um, what, what I've shown there is kind of very high level impacts for the whole world and then also for, for different countries, for developing countries and developed countries. We also provide jurisdiction specific estimates bilaterally to every jurisdiction based on our model. We don't publicize any given jurisdiction's information. The, the inclusive framework member jurisdictions have asked us not to do that, so we don't. Um, but we give every jurisdiction their own data. So if you're an IF member jurisdiction and you, you haven't gotten our results, please let us know and we'll be happy to share them with you and talk you through them and help you understand what the two-pillar solution might mean for you. But increasingly, countries are saying to us, okay, thank you very much for the work that you've done. Thank you very much for your assessment, but your assessment is based on high-level data. I wanna, I wanna carry out my own analysis. So if we could just go to the next slide, so that's really has been an increasingly large focus of our work. So especially with respect to the minimum tax, you know, pillar one is, is still being negotiated, but the minimum tax is, is already in effect in many jurisdictions. And that means 
a lot of countries, especially developing countries, and we saw that in the in the the last session, are thinking kind of right now what they should implement, whether they should implement, how they should implement. And so we have published a, an implementation handbook on Pillar Two to try and help countries think through these choices. It's it's a a very complex um, new measure, uh, as you can see, um, and there's really a lot for countries to think through. However, there's also really a lot of helpful resources online. There's a lot on the OECD website. There's a lot of bilateral assistance available. There's a lot of uh, other good good resources available from the World Bank, the International Institute for Sustainable Development and the IMF. There's a lot of other impact assessment work out in the public domain. So there's really a lot there to help countries think through uh, their decisions. So going to the next slide. So what we have started to try to do is to try and help countries look at their own taxpayer data and to try to help them understand what their own choices are. And really the, the, the main thing that we've been helping countries do is to try and say, okay, countries are, are trying to think about implementing a QDMTT, which is a, a qualified domestic minimum top-up tax. So that's a minimum tax on any low tax profit that I might have in my own jurisdiction, which countries often feel like is the first step that they might wanna take in terms of implementing minimum tax. They wanna start to look at their own profit in their own jurisdiction that somebody else might tax if they don't act and try and see whether they need to act to top it up. But it's not straightforward to try to understand how much low tax profit you might have in your jurisdiction. It's also not straightforward to try and get the, the, the minimum tax base exactly right because it might be different from a country's own tax base. And then also you need to try to understand this substance-based income exclusion, which means that if, if MEs have a large enough physical footprint in your jurisdiction, they can have some low tax profit without being subject to the minimum tax. So thinking through all those complex issues, we're trying to help jurisdictions do that. We're trying to work with jurisdictions so that they can use their own taxpayer data to try and understand these impacts. And then so that they can kind of communicate those findings to their, to their, their, their policymakers so they can make informed decisions. So then uh, just on the next slide, so, so how do we do that? I mean, different, as I said, different countries' impacts are gonna depend on what different countries implement. Because the minimum tax is, is complex, it's based on financial accounts. So there's a lot of different, um, in an ideal world, there's several different data sources can could be mobilized, tax returns, financial accounts, country by country reporting data. Not all countries, especially low capacity countries have that data ready to use. Um, sometimes taxpayers aren't filing tax returns, so it's difficult to understand how much low tax profit is in a country. So there's a really a host of challenges that, that countries are facing when they start to do this work, um, that we, together with partner organizations, World Bank are doing this work, IMF are doing this work, regional, regional organizations are doing this work. So there's a lot of uh, bilateral assistance is available, but this is really um, a, a worthwhile step for developing countries to try to start to, to do as they try and think through uh, their options. It's also important because this is something that's, that's also happening is that um, we deal a lot with finance ministries and tax officials, but a lot of the low tax profit in developing countries stems from tax incentives. Oftentimes those incentives are not provided by finance ministries, they're provided by investment authorities. And so there's also a very important interagency cooperation aspect to this, where countries need to talk to their internal stakeholders, also potentially carry out their analysis together with their internal stakeholders so that they can uh, get the right picture and make the right decisions uh, for them. And I'll just, uh, I'll close then also by, by thanking all of the donors um, who have really provided um, the, the, the funding to, for us to do this work. And, you know, this work has been really important, I think, for trying to provide um, all inclusive framework member jurisdictions with kind of the economic analysis that they can look at these proposals and that they can, you know, think through for themselves what they mean think through for themselves, um, you know, what changes they want. And that's been really important throughout all of the negotiations. Um, uh, I think that this, that this work has helped um, countries, especially smaller countries that might not have the capacity to do this work themselves, to try to make sure that they can also, you know, advocate for their own interest on the basis of, of quantitative, uh, quantitative data. So I think it's been really important and, and those, um, those uh, donors are really important in that regard. Uh, so with that, I'll, I'll close and I uh, hope everyone enjoys uh, the remainder of, of the sessions today and tomorrow. Thank you.